Sunday morning, the Bharatiya Janata Party released a 69 page document called the Sankalp Patra for 2024. It comprises guarantees by Prime Minister uh, Modi, 24 guarantees, and it is called the Modi Guarantee Card. And this comes after the Congress Party's Nyay Patra. So, between these two manifestos, which manifesto promises growth for India, jobs, and a sustained development of its economy. Before we go to our guests on the show today, let us take a quick listen into what Prime Minister Modi and Rahul Gandhi had to say on this subject of their own manifestos. नारी शक्ति गरीब किसान इन सभी को सशक्त करता है हमारा फोकस डिग्निटी ऑफ लाइफ उस पर है हमारा फोकस क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ उस पर है हमारा फोकस निवेश से नौकरी निवेश से नौकरी पर भी है इस संकल्प पत्र में क्वांटिटी ऑफ अपॉर्चुनिटीज और क्वालिटी ऑफ अपॉर्चुनिटीज दोनों पर बहुत जोर दिया गया है हमारे पास ओरिजिनल रास्ता जो था वही हमारा रास्ता है ये ये मैनिफेस्टो कांग्रेस पार्टी ने नहीं बनाया है यह मैनिफेस्टो हिंदुस्तान की जनता ने बनाया है हमने सिर्फ इसको लिखा है जो किसानों ने हमें बताया खारगे जी को बताया मुझे बताया बाकी नेताओं को बताया वो हमने लिखा है चाहे वो रोजगार की बात हो चाहे वो कॉन्ट्रैक्ट लेबर की बात हो हजारों लोगों से बात करके हमने ये well, there you have it. Some of the key words from what the Prime Minister and Rahul Gandhi said. Nivesh se Nokri is the key job related promise of the BJP, of the ruling uh, government. And as far as the Congress party is concerned, the key point there that this is a manifesto according to the Congress that has only been written by the party, but uh, in their words, is actually crowdsourced. So, joining me to decode the manifesto and whether they will have any impact on this Lok Sabha election are some of India's most noted analysts in this space, Shankar Ayer, political economy analyst, author and communist. We are also uh, joined by Shekhar Ayer, a very senior journalist. Professor of Economics Santosh Mahrotra is also joining us. He teaches at the University of Bath in the United Kingdom. We will also be joined by other guests during the course of the show. Shankar, I am coming to you. A tale of two manifestos, Modi's uh, guarantees versus Rahul's Nyay. What will actually deliver growth for India between the two? Well, much of it will depend on the execution. I mean, you can promise whatever you want to promise, but I mean, you know, how do you execute it and who's got the record of executing? That is the key. Uh, to manifestos. But I, you know, Siddharth, I think manifestos are not written particularly with the focus on growth, while they might say so. I think it is the growth of the market share in the electoral base that is being targeted. If you look at the Congress manifesto, obviously they see an opportunity in the distress in the agriculture, they see an opportunity in the repeated mention of unemployment as a key concern, they see an opportunity. Uh, in the issues of individual rights. But whether either of them will propel growth, I must say that as early as 2013 and before that, India's demography came into the picture. I think regardless of how we see uh, the unrolling of the promises, the India story is largely intact and is going to be there because we have the largest domestic market and what matters is 
how do they spur consumption and investment and one last point that i wanted to make i mean you know this is more in terms of how the approach of the two parties is the bjp manifesto is personalized but the processes are institutionalized the congress manifesto is institutional in the sense that they say that we have only released it it's written by the people but all the promises are personalized so whether the personal approach or the institutional approach uh, is uh, works the question that both parties have to sort of understand that that there are issues that are at the core of uh, india's living uh, in terms of what pain people are feeling and in terms of the ease of living which the prime minister spoke about i mean you know just to take water as an issue i think both the parties have given uh, lip service i don't see any serious attempt to solve the issues okay shankar uh, you touched upon several points and the point about water uh, is uh, significant because india's silicon valley uh, pride of india's tech prowess bengaluru and see what is happening as far as water is concerned there shekhar i am coming to you still on the big picture uh, a quick perusal of the bjp manifesto actually made me feel as if i was reading a budget document uh, you think this is uh, this is um, in continuation because uh, as far as the government is concerned it is functioning as if elections are just uh, something that uh, uh, are a two month period for them to go out into the field and the process of governance is uh, continuing but is it giving us hints in terms of the broader political economy focus that uh, the modi government believes in uh, you are absolutely right chandar if you were if you feel that some of the things that has mentioned in the manifesto you have heard it before either during pms interventions in parliament or by inaugurating projects or laying foundation stones or in several meetings that he has addressed uh, in the last uh, few months it, it, it will appear that it comes from there yes there is a definite effort to see that there is a continuity hmm. and then there is also a transition and overall effort seems to be policy interventions so if you look at uh, the manifesto of the bjp it more seems like the, the, there are all indications for already the policy initiatives have started there are going to be more interventions more mm. tweaking the ultimate idea is that the employment will come from the growth the employment will come from uh, what is india has always believed you know that you go for a trickle down kind of economy mm. you create go- growth and accordingly jobs will be created and accordingly prepare the population for you know reskill the uh, youth for those kind of jobs it's a mm. long term view with a lot of short term goals and mm. this is exactly the prime minister view that is reflected you know when i look at this both now congress for instance the congress manifesto has now finally congress has realized that this is the path ahead for us and this is what we are going to do but i still get the feeling there is a bandaid approach in the congress manifesto because still the kind of there is still an approach towards doles towards state intervention without indicating you know where are you going to find that kind of resources you know uh, like 1 lakh uh, rupees you know for, for the family for graduates for women there are so many things it's all about particular sections that the congress is looking at which it considers is support based and which needs intervention uh, uh, there are interventional matters right the bjp manifesto also but these are policy uh, interventions and there seems to be a some kind of a planning that has gone in because right. bjp takes the manifesto seriously because what were promised in 2014 did happen and 2019 to for for a lot of us was initially we were taken by surprise whether at the removal of article 370 or uh, you know many other things that were mentioned were done and right. do not forget in uh, 1998 the bjp right. manifesto had mentioned the second nuclear test many of us did not take it seriously until it happened that was much by government first decision so okay. whatever is mentioned in sankalp patra that's why they call it a sankalp patra not a manifesto is a broad indication of things to come and pm has already indicated in a 100 day plan there a lot of things are going to happen in the 100 day right. plan big ticket decisions will be taken 
Okay, let us let us get Professor Mehrotra in uh, as well. Uh, Professor, you were with us after the Congress manifesto was released. We now have the benefit of the BJP manifesto in front of us. Uh, as the economist here, uh, the question is what manifesto according to you uh, promises to deliver long term sustainable uh, economic growth. Uh, remember, uh, the BJP manifesto has actually a portion that is devoted to uh, saying very clearly that there will be no compromise on fiscal prudence. But like we discussed on the earlier show, if we try and do the math on the Congress promises, the bill is going to be very, very uh, large and there are concerns as to who will have to foot the bill when it comes to raising the resources. So compare the two manifestos for our audience. Surely, thank you very much for having me. Um, Let's just uh, recall the record first in the last 10 years compared to the preceding 10 years. First on growth and then on jobs and then we can come to the evaluation of the, of the manifesto. Let's just recall that between 2004 and 14, the economy grew by 7.7% per annum and it generated 7.5 million new non-farm jobs every year. By contrast, in the last 10 years, the economy has grown at 5.8% per annum and it has barely generated 2.9 million jobs per annum. So, you already there have a record. What creates jobs and what creates growth is investment, I think, as one of your panelists rightly said. But let's just try and understand why the growth rate was much higher earlier. It was higher because the investment to GDP ratio was between 31% and 38%. Each year, that was the range, 31 to 38% of GDP between 2004 and 14. By contrast, it has never reached in the last 10 years 31%. It has come down to 26%. It has mm. the range between 26 and 31%, which is the reason why, you know, the, the BJP manifesto is talking about mudra. You know, mudra is about the silliest scheme one can think of. Because what the manifesto talks about is 20 lakh more mudra loans. You know mm. what the what 95% of all mudra loans, 95% are under 50,000. In fact, their average size is actually 29,000. Hmm. Now, to actually create a job, can even one person make a living by taking a loan which also has to be repaid? Please understand, the person has to repay while making enough money on, on top of the loan to actually ensure that his family has a, has a livelihood. So the fact of the matter is that the, it's the mudra which is the dole which is the reason why your youth unemployment rate between 20 and 24 is 44 percent. So, right. you know, honestly, the, I don't see a long term approach to, a, to India becoming a developed economy. And we really have run out of time because in 15 years, we will be a we will be an aging society by 2040. Right. Our demographic dividend is gone. And I right. don't think anyone in this government actually recognizes this. And I'm sorry to say that it's pretty much a continuation of what you have currently. That's all. Okay. Okay. Uh, Shankar, I'm coming back to you. Uh, the, the big uh, uh, point in the run-up was, and Prime Minister Modi has also spoken about it, is Ravdi's. And that became a big political flashpoint. We'll avoid that debate. But the question really is, in terms of comparing the Congress promises, which will come if it they were to be implemented although the example of himachal pradesh and karnataka does not uh, make me very enthusiastic that the uh, congress if it were to come to power will be able to fulfill all those promises is going to be huge and astronomical uh, and compare that with the B bjp which is basically continuation of what it has been doing uh, do you think the bjp has consciously tried to avoid the trap of getting into a competitive freebie nomics Well, Siddharth, it is the context that makes us define what is freebie and what is populism. If you remember, in the 15th Finance Commission was appointed 
there was a huge debate on what populism was and all the southern states went up in arms hmm. if you look at this the culture of populism it's most prevalent in the south hmm. and it is the south which is growing at a higher rate of so one cannot directly say this but i will say this much that no party can claim immunity on the question of freebies we have simultaneously watched this government say that so many people have been lifted out of poverty mm. and yet we have a la- world's largest food program which feeds 800 million people we also have one of the world's largest health care systems we also have one of the world's largest rural employment system the scheme so the question of populism i think we should leave it to the voters and the parties what is important is does the spend deliver the propulsion that the economy needs now there are two divergent views money in the hands of the people and money that is being invested both have issues we have had a uh, a very high level of investment in infrastructure as much as 10 lakh crores mm. i think in the last 7 years the government has spent about 70 lakh crores and krisil says that they will probably spend twice that much in the next 7 years mm. now these monies are going into creation of physical assets required for speeding up uh, logistics for facilitating movement for right. all kinds of things from railways to roads to everything now does that pay back in terms of jobs in terms of consumption we'll have to wait the data in the latest gdp suggests that while investment led growth has been good private final consumption has been low and this hmm. is visible in the balance sheets of the fmcg companies and fast moving goods and all so the question that we are we have to address is how many of the problems are being solved and the big elephant in the room siddhar is not just about employment it is about creating the skill sets india's largest employer outside of the armed forces and the security agencies that we see everywhere is the infra- information technology sector and that sector as you know covering the it companies has not been in the pink of health as let me put it that way absolutely uh, uh, and and shankar some of those headlines some of those headlines you have hit it uh, uh, absolutely correctly uh, tcs for example has had its uh, lowest um, uh, hiring uh, uh, projections and lowest headcount in fact in many many years let me bring in aditi uh, fadnis uh, political editor of the business standard also uh, into uh, the debate aditi you've been listening to our uh, guests and the point really that i want at this stage is that when it comes to the congress manifesto it's very clear that it doubles down on uh, something that they tried in 2019 as well and takes the concept of a welfare state uh, and basically pushes it on steroids uh, there are some calculations which suggest that the bill for only the promise for women for 1 lakh rupees per annum will run up to as much as 4.3 lakh crore and who will bear the bill where will the revenues come for that these are questions that perhaps the congress also doesn't have answers for at this point of time uh, stack the two promises and uh, try and tell our viewers what will score in terms of a manifesto with the indian voter well uh, the bjp's manifesto is uh, i think a bit little bit less detailed than the congress uh the congress has uh, possibly because it can afford to do so being in the opposition has been much more detailed uh, uh by comparison bjp sounds like uh, motherhood and apple pie but mm-hmm. the fact is that the advantage of uh, the bjp is that they have uh, implemented stuff and they the voters are seeing the result of that on the ground i have seen the uh, i've traveled to up and i've seen the transformative effect uh not just in terms of real money but also in terms of morale and uh, well dare i say so self respect uh, among small farmers 
because of the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nithi. In fact, many of them asked me if they were going to increase it in the budget. This trip was uh, done before the budget. And uh, uh, possibly when the, when the final budget is presented in July, you will see a 3,000 rupee increase over the 6,000 rupees that is being given right now. Uh, the point is that for the first time, many sections of our society have learned to handle money. And I think that is a very important and a very empowering uh, sort of uh, weapon uh, that people are now uh, holding in their hands. It may not result in consumption. It may not. It may result in different things. We don't really know. But uh, just the fact that there is somebody out there who's looking out for you uh, is a very big enabler, in my view. Okay, uh, Shankar, um, uh, Shekhar Iyer, I am coming to you. Uh, Shekhar, the there was a debate where it was. Uh, in the past said that the BJP is being fiscally conservative, even post-COVID, they, they said that instead of uh, distributing money, let's focus on uh, supply side reforms and all of that. But today, given the promises in both manifestos, and some are absolutely radical, like Aditi said, the opposition can afford to do that, a ruling party cannot. Uh, isn't there basically no difference between what the BJP is promising and what the Congress is promising except for the level of detail? Shekhar Aya. No, no, more than the detail of the approach also. See, here I mentioned a comparison was made of the decade between 2000 growth story between 2004 and uh, uh, 14 and between 14 and uh, 24. But we must not forget that this period, that the decade that went by, saw one of the worst crisis you know facing the globe the COVID, the COVID pulled everything down no government in india has ever faced a crisis like that we have to take into account that and people you know by and large just as aditi was mentioning they also believe in the leadership that is making the promise the basically question is are the voters going to trust prime minister bodhi are they going to trust rahul gandhi because you can make promises manifestos actually don't win elections but at the same time when you see a continuity, when you see that, like for instance, the PM uh, Awaz Yojana, four crore houses have been built. Now here the promise is being made for another three crore houses. Those who have got houses, irrespective of you know uh, caste or religion or anything, those people know that this is happening. Similarly, cooking gas cylinder, now the PM is talking of piped gas, so mm -hmm. that more of those cylinders will be free to cover other areas. So each and everything that is mentioned in the manifesto is, is something that has come out of the policy initiatives and the policy initiatives that are going to happen. So once the elections are through, and he has been telling officials that after June 4th, we get cracking. That means the prime minister already has a plan. Right. And already we know what has happened. You know, the same promises were made in Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh election. People did not buy that uh, promises. And look at the situation in Karnataka and Himachal. OPS, that is old pension scheme, was mentioned in Himachal. Was mentioned in the, I mean, mentioned. Even it was said it will be implemented in Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh. And no mention is made of OPS here. Because some reality check has also been done by the people who have written the Congress manifesto. Okay. Uh, uh, Aditi, I am coming to you before I go to Professor Merutra. Aditi, quick one here. Uh, what in your sense is the more believable? Is it... Is it the guarantees of Prime Minister Modi and the personality, the point that Shekhar was making that you may promise the moon, but the voter, the Indian voter is intelligent enough to go with uh, those he feels uh, are going to deliver. And the contrast in what some of uh, the state elections we saw, where the state government uh, that has come into power in Himachal Pradesh, for example, and others is finding it difficult to implement the promises. Well, I think uh, Himachal has already implemented OPS, as far as I know. And uh, I think the first uh, pension was has already been received by various people. Uh, I think that's not the point. The point is that, uh, first of all, state governments are different from central governments. Uh, also, there is no doubt uh, a, a fairly credible uh, image of uh, Prime Minister Modi. But equally, we must not forget the Jumla that uh, you know 15 lakh or 5 lakh or whatever that some will be deposited in people's accounts which which was floated uh, uh, attributed to the home minister uh, before the 
2014 election. So, people are pretty discriminating. They are not fools. And uh, they would like to go by what they are getting in their bank account rather than uh, promises that are being made in manifestos. Okay. Uh, Professor Merotra, going by that uh, metric, do you think the BJP has an edge? Because uh, as far as money being deposited directly in bank accounts, I think the BJP uh, in the centre as well as state governments, wherever the BJP has been in power, uh, scores better due to the digital push that whatever was promised reached these bank accounts directly, Professor Merotra. There has been use of the digital infrastructure that has been built and direct benefit transfers have happened and that has reduced some leakage. I mean, no one denies that. But let's just look at the facts here. You know, who's been fiscally prudent? This, when this government came to power 10 years ago, its total debt was 55 lakh crores. It now stands at over 200 lakh crores. That's near quadrupling in a matter of 10 years. 56% of GDP debt went to 82% of GDP. That's where we currently stand. I was on the, on the uh, Congress manifesto. I think you, you talked about some numbers. I was listening to Praveen Chakrabarti, who was leading the effort on behalf of Congress in an interview with Karan Thapar. And he says that the cost estimated as of now is rupees 1.25 lakh crores per annum. Total of the entire manifesto, you were talking about 4 lakh crores for just the Mahalakshmi, which is that cash transfer. Let's just 4. remember. 4.3 lakh crore. 4.3 lakh crore. No, no, I'm not cutting you off, sir. But just to clarify that, 4.3 lakh crore only for that uh, scheme uh, and that estimate by... Uh, uh, by, a, by an economist uh, who, uh, you know, doesn't want to get uh, drawn into the political debate and that's why declines with to go due, on record. Economist, uh, Mr. Zarabia, the, with all due respect to that economist, let's just recall that it's a mere 1 lakh rupees per annum, which will be given no more to no more than 10% of the women. Because if it will be given only to the poor, poor, poor women. We know that. It's always been said. If, if we had poverty at 20% in 2012, and we assume that poverty has come down to 10 or, or even less, so it will be given only to 10. That's, a, that's the second point. The third point that was being made by one of your panelists is about the need for creating the skill sets in our, in our young workforce. Well, you know what? The skill India has been running now for 10 years without much to show for it, only 2.3%. 2.4% of the total workforce is currently vocationally formally trained, believe it or not. What is the Congress offering by contrast? The Congress is saying there is already an Apprenticeship Act of 1961. We are going to make it truly effective and we are going to give a, a one year's apprenticeship which will be shared between the employer and the government which will ensure a pathway to young people who have without work X. They don't get a job. This is the problem. Youth unemployment, if it's running at 44%, that's a serious, serious problem. So, you know, as far as Jumla's are concerned, he's absolutely spot on. We know two crore jobs per annum were, were promised. What did I tell you? How many jobs have in fact been delivered? To 29 lakhs non-farm jobs have been delivered per annum over this period. So, and as far as that point about, you know, COVID haven't intervened, let's just remember there was a global economic crisis also in the period in, in 2008-9, which whose effects also continued for a while. And mm. no, let's not go gaga about how COVID was handled. We had 45 lakh deaths. The government might be claiming 4.5 lakh, but no one in the world, including WHO, doesn't be, you know, believes that. So, you know, let's... And the fact of the matter is central governments have much more fiscal space than state governments now, especially after GST, the fiscal space of the states has shrunk enormously. The, on the contrary, it's the center which has much more fiscal space. And if you get growth back, you know, that will happen only with investment. If you get growth back to 8% per annum, which you have no choice but to deliver, Otherwise, you cannot deliver the jobs that are needed. Otherwise, we are running out of the demographic dividend. 
we can sit in our air conditioned you know rooms and discuss this till the cows come home but the fact of the matter is in 15 years our dividend is gone we'll become an aging society i don't think any of our media is aware of this our policy makers are not aware of this and they're not this is not even part of the thinking unfortunately right right Sh- uh, shankar ayer i am coming to you and uh, while professor merotra makes these uh, points very passionately uh, if you talk to uh, people in the ruling party uh, they will say ha ye sab theek hai but aayega to modi hi so despite all of this despite the debate and despite some of the key issues that need to be uh, uh, debated there's absolutely no doubt about that uh, the belief seems to be that aayega to modi hi shankar but that seems to be the general perception i mean you know you don't hear anybody even in the opposition talking about a defeat of the bjp in the election the general narrative is basically about whether they will be curtailed or i mean the range is now between what they had in 2019 305 to the problem the idea of ab ki baar 400 baar but one has to be careful about second guessing the voters in 2004 the run up to the election almost everybody on the congress lt sort of went gaga about india shining and mm. about the return of the vajpayee government mm. so i am very very watchful about what works for this government is that in the 10 years they have instituted digital transfer they created the digital public infrastructure they have created the physical infrastructure what requires to be done and what will probably be the differentiator opening question whether there will be growth is that if we can find if they can institute ways to uh, enable energy transition so the rooftop solar thing finally india is talking in kilowatt hours instead of megawatt big dreams that's a big idea if okay. they can actually implement recycling of water grey water hydrolysis uh i am coming back to water because i think it is the single biggest issue facing this country and the third part is that leader of the manifestos is talking about fixing the mess the broken primary education system hmm. if we are to employ the young population with a median age of 27 and remember siddharth that half of the country is still to reach 26 in median age the north of india is still young and still growing the south of india is actually partially aging so once you look at the demographic of india you realize that there is an urgent need to fix the education problem primary education and then we can get to skilling and other things and some of these issues are lying with the state governments and so who can coordinate better with the states who is running the state those are the questions that come up but Absolutely. as aditi said the, the, the vote is not being cast on a 5 year plan or a 10 year plan or a 40 year plan i think the vote is being cast on who the voter trusts to deliver tomorrow absolutely and that trust uh, the viewers uh, we'll wait to see what uh, voters do but as i leave you let me also uh, remind you about one more snippet from the bjp manifesto seven bullet trains that will connect india and that's great and all seven of them will have stops at ayodhya so look at how the bjp is marrying development uh, and uh, infrastructure advance along with uh, the deep rooted cultural beliefs and our uh, religion by getting people together on that uh, point and i think that's one of the key reasons why the comparison between the bjp manifesto and the congress manifesto in political terms has also been made uh, from the stage by no less than the prime minister but we'll leave that for some other time for now i want to thank all my guests for their time with us today and for making the effort to try and dissect which of these two manifestos does good for india's growth 
Professor Mehrotra, Aditi Fadnis, Shankar Ayer and Shekhar Ayer, thank you very much for your time with us today. We'll be back with more. Until then, goodbye.